Hey guys, Adam from Arrowworks Productions. And today we want to talk about our top 10 myths and misconceptions with the FAA Part 107, similar to how we did it when Section 333 was out. Number one, I heard it from a guy on Facebook, so it must be true. Uh, this is a really bad way to get your advice on 107. If you're planning on getting a 107 or you already have a 107 and you're not sure about how to operate safely or legally under a 107, Facebook is probably not the best choice for legal advice. There are several guys out there that actually specialize not only in aviation law, but they specialize in drone or UAS law. I would highly recommend that if you have serious questions to consult with an aviation attorney or the FAA website for those information. 107 versus hobby. Do I need a 107? That's, that's a good question. So the FAA stance on this is if, if you're making money with your drone or your UAS, you need to have a part 107, similar to how we used to have to have a 333 exemption. Now, luckily for you guys, you don't have to have that pilot requirement anymore, but you do have to pass the 107 test to become a commercial operator. Now, there's a lot of misconceptions when it comes to the 107, like I'm a realtor and I just wanna take pictures of the houses that I'm selling. I'm not selling my photographs, so I should be okay, right? Actually, no. If you're a realtor and you're selling properties, you are benefiting from potentially those photos that you took of your property. Uh, same as uh, in the case of, let's say, a farmer. A farmer wants to go out and take photos of his property, beautiful photos of his farm, that's hobbyist. If that same farmer goes out and says, wow, I got some great shots of my land, but I see it's a little dry over there, I'm going to target my watering and fertilizer to those areas. He is now doing that for the betterment of his business, in which case he is operating commercially and therefore he needs a 107. Make sure you check, and there's a lot of good information on the FAA website when it comes to hobby, commercial, business, pleasure, and so on, and check those charts out. Aircraft registration. Anything in the UAS world that's over 0.55 pounds has to be registered with the FAA. There's only one legitimate website to do that, and that's www.registermyuas.faa.gov. It's $5 and you can register either as a hobbyist, in which case you pay one $5 fee and put a number on all of your aircraft, or as a commercial operator or a non-hobbyist, in which case it's $5 for each aircraft as you get a unique number for each aircraft. If you're paying any more than $5, you're not on the right site. Contacting ATC as a 107 operator. There's a lot of confusion on the forums. What radio should I buy and what number do I call? At this point in the 107 operations, all air traffic control towers and managers have been instructed and should be directing you to the online authorization system. You should not be calling ATC on the phone as a 107 operator. With over 50,000 registered aircraft and 20 or 30,000 107 operators, if everybody was calling the tower, they would not be able to handle and manage manned aircraft. There is an online waiver system for getting and being granted airspace authorizations, among other things, and we'll put a link down in the description to where that is. Authorizations versus waivers. There are several waivers that can be attained as a 107 operator. Some of the popular ones right now are for night flight or multiple aircraft in the air or operating from a moving vehicle, flight over people. These waivers have to be addressed individually, meaning that a waiver is something you're asking to be exempt from from the normal regulations. You don't plan on following regulations, so there's some part of them that you wanna be waived from. An airspace authorization is basically asking for a one time or many times permission to operate within a specific airspace. Now we know as a 107 operator, or you should know, that you can operate in class G airspace without contacting anybody. As soon as you enter into class E to the surface, D, B, or C, you have to be uh, request and be granted an airspace authorization to operate there. 
and that is done through the online process. That is essentially your notification to air traffic control that you want to operate in their airspace. They do not want a phone call. They want you to do that during the waiver and authorization process. Now, I had a question myself and I contacted the FAA. What's the difference between an airspace authorization and an airspace waiver? And essentially, it boils down to an airspace authorization is essentially you contacting the FAA for a specific flight on a specific day or over a period of time. A waiver is you contacting the FAA and saying, listen, I, I want to do something outside of the normal operations. Maybe I don't want to talk to the tower or contact the tower. I'm going to be doing a flight at 50 feet within three miles of the airport. I'm going to be doing it on a regular basis. Here's the proposed operations, and I'm going to be doing this all the time. I don't want to have to go through the authorization process. So I would like to get a waiver to waive those requirements uh, for operating within your airspace. That is what a a waiver is under the airspace waivers. Now, I've been told from an insider at the FAA, they haven't even really granted any airspace waivers. And again, I say waivers, not authorizations, because we know there's been a lot of authorizations granted, but an airspace waiver is something that's a very unique and specific request. Another myth and misconception is the five mile radius. We hear that a lot. I see it a lot posted on Facebook forums and other places like, I'm a 107 operator and I'm four miles from this airport. Do I need to call the tower? Do I need to get request permission? As a 107 operator, that five mile radius goes out the door. We don't go by radius anymore. We go by airspace. And as a 107 operator, you should know and understand the classes of airspace, where you can operate, what altitudes you can operate, and so on. So there is no radius from an airport that applies to a 107 operator. That applies to hobbyists, in which case if you're five miles from an airport, you should be contacting the tower to let them know that you're operating. Again, you're not asking for permission, you're letting them know that you're operating there. Another question, okay, great, I just got my 107, I'm all good to go, right? Not exactly. You need to check with your local uh, ordinances, your local city uh, rules. You, you need to make sure there's no other permitting required. There are some states and towns now that are requiring additional UAS permits or licenses. Uh, in some cases, online training to be done first. And there are also some other things regarding state licensing that you might need to address. Uh, we have also been contacted uh, regarding aircraft that are in numbered uh, that require state taxes to be paid on those. So there's a lot of other things you need to look at. You need to inspect and investigate in your own state the rules and regulations regarding U.S. operations. Record keeping. We get this a lot. We're actually one that created the, the commercial UAS logbook. Now, a lot of people will get on and they'll say, they'll argue that, hey, I don't have to record my time. I does it in the Go app or I do, I use Litchi or whatever. Uh, here's the thing with record keeping. The FAA as a 107 operator requires you to do a pre-flight checklist. Uh, they also require you to record any maintenance that's done. If you're not logging that, I don't know how you're gonna prove you're doing it. So we recommend and actually we use and we sell a written logbook that has a pre-flight checklist. It has a maintenance record, logbooks, and everything in there. So if you ever do get a ramp check or you get an investigation into your operations and they wanna know uh, what's your pre-flight procedures or what's your uh, maintenance history and you don't have anything to show for that, you could be in a little bit of trouble. So we wanna make sure that people are out there uh, and, and that they know that you need to keep some kind of a record for your UAS operations as a commercial operator. I wanna talk a little bit about night flight and flight over people waivers right now. Those are really popular ones and kind of controversial. Uh, the night flight waiver is probably the most um, approved waiver at this point. People just wanna fly at night, whether they're doing filmmaking, whether they're doing thermal inspections. Uh, and as you know or may not know, when you apply for any of the waivers, all waivers are granted based on what the FAA calls performance-based standards. They're easy to download, we'll put the link down in the description, and they're individual to each individual waiver. You need to address those waivers. A simple statement like, I wanna fly at night because I do thermal work is not going to get you granted a waiver. You need to describe the entire proposed operations, 
all your mitigation uh, methods, your safety protocols, your fallback and fail safes. You need to describe the entire operation and why do you need to be exempt or wavered from the rule that says that you can't fly at night as a 107 operator. So make sure you read those performance-based standards and, and address all of them, or you'll be sitting in a 90-day queue only to find out that you were denied. Now, flight over people, that's a tough one. We know as a fact, to date, not one waiver for flight over people has been granted. There is one company, and that is CNN, that was granted a waiver for flight over people, and that was during their 333 exemption process, not during the 107 process. Uh, and again, to give you some more information on that waiver, that's for a tethered drone, meaning one that's connected to a power source or a box on the ground, and only to 21 feet. Now, for anybody that does any kind of mapping, inspections, filmmaking, would know 21 feet with a tethered drone is not going to allow me to do my business. So currently, there is not one waiver granted for flight over people. Now, they are currently working on uh, addressing that and maybe reorganizing those rules. And we sure hope they come out soon because a lot of us in this business that work commercially and fly big aircraft uh, that do mapping, we need to be able to fly over people occasionally. Lastly, I want to talk a little bit about enforcement. We've seen a lot of illegal activity on Facebook, on YouTube, on people's websites, flying over people, flying over roads and highways. Listen, guys, the FAA is not manned up to go surfing around and looking at Facebook and YouTube. In the off chance that they do come across something that's really extraordinary and out of the norm, like the Skypan case, which if, you, if you're not familiar with, was a company that operated UAS out of Chicago and New York and they flew in some of the busiest airspace. They were fined over $1.9 million and they just recently settled about a week ago for about $250,000. That's way out of the norm. Most uh, contact with the FAA when you're doing something slightly uh, out of uh, the rules, their first enforcement action is education. They're going to make contact with you. They're going to say, hey, you know, we saw that you did X, Y, and Z. Did you know you're not allowed to do that? Uh, here's a pamphlet on the rules. Don't do it again or you might get in some trouble. So you need to be out there operating safely, but know that there's not going to be a SWAT team from the FAA knocking on your door should you maybe not know the rules exactly or you go outside something that you're not supposed to do. Not saying go ahead and do that. I'm just saying that a lot of people go, oh, this guy's got a fine coming or this guy's got, you know, he's going to be arrested. Most likely not. The FAA can't do that uh, at this time. And the fact that their first uh, course of action is always going to be education. And that applies to both manned and unmanned aircraft. Well, hey guys, I hope you found this short segment educational. Uh, check out our website, www.aeroworksproductions.com. We offer a lot of uh, both in-person and online training uh, as far as 107, UAS operations, commercial operations, uh, how to fly your drone safely. Uh, we look forward to uh, hearing from you. Leave a comment, make sure you like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.